In the words of the legendary chef and my personal hero, Anthony Bourdain, food is everything we are. It's an extension of a nationalist feeling, ethnic feeling, your personal history, your province, your region, your tribe, your grandma. It's inseparable from those from the get-go. Welcome to Every Dish, A Story, a podcast about a place of food in our lives and what it meant to our ancestors. I'm your host, Kat, and I'm going to take you to a new location every two weeks to connect to who we are. There is a saying that there's nothing a good grilled cheese sandwich can't fix. Welcome to Every Dish of Story, episode 8. I'm your host, Kat, and today we're going to be jumping all over the place in search of the perfect grilled cheese sandwich. A character of Sam, who was portrayed by a teenage Johnny Depp in the 1993 comedy film Benny and June, uses a clothes iron to make a stack of grilled cheese sandwiches. A very offensive culinary approach for sure, but it's, it's a significant moment for this homestyle sandwich, since whatever Johnny Depp touches must be important, right? But it is crucial, because in any given month in America, around three quarters of those who purchase cheese slices cook grilled cheese sandwiches at home. And while it is true that the French have been making croque monsieur since 1910s, the modern grilled cheese sandwich has its roots in Otto Frederick Rawader's invention of the bread slicer, which made white bread distribution more efficient and less expensive. Rawader is known as the father of sliced bread. James L. Kraft, a businessman who invented a groundbreaking pasteurizing procedure to keep cheese fresh even when shipped across the large distances, had patented processed cheese only a few years before. First Kraft Foods facility opened in Illinois in 1914. Five years later, the company had already expanded into Canada, making Kraft Foods one of the largest food corporations in the world. Of course, this quote-unquote factory cheese, which uh, the English who were passionately proud of their cheddars, mockingly referred to as rat trap cheese or rat cheese, was not considered delicacy in any way. Simply put, it was just a low-cost solution that could be scaled up. And this is when sliced bread and processed cheese really start to gain popularity. Thousands of American cheese-filled sandwiches were made by Navy chefs aboard ships during World War II, using recipes from official cookbooks. These were traditionally served open-faced in the 1940s and 1950s and comprised of one piece of bread with grated cheese on top. When Kraft Foods first produced Kraft Sickles in 1949, it was only a matter of time until they were available in stores throughout the country. And it was around the same time a second piece of bread was put on top, perhaps to increase the sandwich's filling capacity, giving rise to the contemporary concept of grilled cheese sandwich as we know today. However, the phrase grilled cheese doesn't appear in literature until the 1960s. Before then, it was always referred to as toasted cheese or melted cheese sandwiches. It doesn't really matter how you make the sandwich, as it has been done in a variety of ways in the past. In Sarah Tyson Rohrer's Mrs. Rohrer's new cookbook, published in 1902, a recipe for quote-unquote melted cheese asks for baking the ingredients in a hot oven. In Florence Cowell's 700 Sandwiches, published in 1929, a recipe called for broiling the ingredients to produce toasted cheese. Toasted Sandwich from the Boston Cooking School cookbook, released in 1939, instructed cooks to broil or even saute the ingredients. And Irma Rambauer suggested that bread and cheese be cooked in a commercial waffle iron for a supper that even, quote-unquote, the maidless host could make, in her book The Joy of Cooking from 1953. There are all sorts of strange stories connected with the sandwich these days. In 2004, for example, an online casino, GoldenPalace.com, paid $28,000 for a half-eaten grilled sandwich, which clearly displayed an image of the Virgin Mary in its crust. Yeah. After a Florida woman tried her luck on eBay and ultimately succeeding with the sandwich, she sold it to the casino after keeping it safe and sound for 10 years. In other stories, uh, American competitive eater Joey Chestnut, among 47 records in various food disciplines under his belt, is also a record holder for eating grilled cheese. In 2006, he was able to eat 47 in 10 minutes. When Kraft Foods spent a record $1.4 billion on marketing in 2007, the majority of it was aimed at reviving Kraft singles and quote-unquote great getting grilled cheese back on the list of fast food menu alternatives. If you're over 30 like me, you remember MySpace. Well, MySpace launched a contest for a chance to win $50,000 in which users were urged to produce and submit home videos honoring grilled cheese. The goal? 
well, quote unquote, to get consumers to make just one additional grilled cheese sandwich a year, stated the Kraft Global Senior Creative Director at the time. The following year, Kraft asked fans to write about their most memorable grilled cheese experience for a chance to win a free box of Kraft singles. And for the first time ever, a grilled cheese cooking competition was held in Los Angeles in 2009. A good grilled cheese sandwich is definitely something to adore. Two slices of buttered bread stuffed with gooey cheese and roasted till golden brown. Mmm. It is a sandwich that both children and adults like. But who invented grilled cheese? Well, the short answer? We don't know. Grilling bread and cheese has been a popular pastime for ages. When it comes to preparing a meal, the ancient Romans, surprise, surprise, recommended mixing bread and cheese together before digging into dinner. 1910 was the year of the first appearance of Croque Monsieur in France. And in the early 1900s, grilled cheese sandwiches made their way into the American diet on a regular basis. It was Sarah Tyson's Rohr's, Mrs. Rohr's new cookbook that made the first mention of the melted cheese sandwich in 1902. Subtype of a cheesy sandwich dish is included in numerous cookbooks from the 1950s and forward. Otto Frederick Rauwerder invented a bread slicing machine in 1927, and by 1932, bakeries were selling more sliced bread than unsliced bread. Open-faced grilled sandwiches were popular during the Great Depression because they were very inexpensive. During the Depression, it is speculated that the second slice of bread was added to the sandwich to increase its filling capacity. As a result, the toasted cheese sandwich evolved into the grilled cheese sandwich we know today. And of course, the cooks in the Navy used the government cookbook that featured a recipe for American cheese-filled sandwich during World War II. The veterans of World War II then introduced them to the American diet, and soon they became a staple in almost every house. Kraft Foods created a shelf-stable prepackaged cheese slices in 1949. Also, unlike cheddar, it did not solidify when melted, making it the preferred choice for the toasted cheese and melted cheese sandwiches. By the 1960s, this sandwich was often referred to as the grilled cheese sandwich in literature. As a result, the sandwich has grown through the years from two slices of toasted bread and melted cheese to a more complex sandwich. It's no longer only American cheese that people use, they experiment with other cheese combinations. The combinations of bacon and tomato is rather common. Sourdough or rye bread is currently being used in place of sliced white bread. There's one thing that hasn't changed though, and it's the sandwich. Throughout history and across the globe, there have been many, many variations of this delectable sandwich, baked, broiled, sautéed, or even waffled, were some of the earliest methods for making a sandwich. To make a grilled cheese sandwich today, you may also use a vast variety of different ingredients and approaches. Let's look at some of the international versions. First up, France. The word croquet means crunch, and the word monsieur means gentleman. Hence, the name croque monsieur literally translated as crunchy mister. And it is a gentleman sandwich through and through. It first appeared in Marcel Proust's book In Search of Lost Time in 1918, although it appeared on the menus of Parisian restaurants as early as 1910. Good bread, cheese and ham, that's all you need to make this dish. The bread most often used is the brioche bread, sometimes it is coated with an egg before frying. And today most people actually prefer the regular sliced bread for this dish. To make the dish nutritious or low calorie, you should always use white bread. Usually Gruyere or Emmental cheeses are used, although sometimes Comte cheese is substituted. To melt the cheese and give the bread a light crust, sandwiches are often sprinkled with cheese on top as well. Bechamel sauce is often used in restaurants as a flavor enhancer, as many French sauces are actually based on bechamel. It is a creamy mixture of milk, butter and flour. Croque Madame is created by adding an egg on top of the sandwich. In the 1960s, there were a rise in the use of the name, which is said to refer to a type of a woman's hat. Croque Mademoiselle is a vegetarian version without ham, but with cucumber and herbs. It is actually much less common than the other two. Our next stop will be Italy. Although the first mention of panini in the United States dates back to 1956, and the predecessor appeared in a 16th century Italian cookbook, panini sandwiches became fashionable in Milan bars called paninoteche in the 1970s, when office workers were looking for a quick lunch option. 
quickly trend the American restaurants, especially in the New York City, began selling these sandwiches, and their popularity then spread to other American cities, each with their own distinctive variations of the sandwich. In many English-speaking countries, a panino, which is translated from Italian as little bread or bun, is a grilled sandwich made with fresh, unsliced bread. The plural form of the word panino in Italian is panini, which is most familiar to us. Examples of bread used for panini are ciabatta, focaccia, and Italian baguettes. The bread is cut horizontally and filled with deli ingredients or other foods and then grilled. Sandwich presses, often called panini presses, are widespread and used. So the panini sandwich has been around since at least the 1960s. And over time, panini has evolved from an elite dish to a popular sandwich for everybody. Traditional combinations of toppings in Italy may include mozzarella with tomato, arugula and or prosciutto, prosciutto, cheese and olive tapenade, prosciutto and fontina cheese, brisola with goat cheese or stracchino cheese. When Italian paninis are offered outside of Italy, they tend to vary considerably from the source. The biggest no-nos are the use of more than one type of meat, which is very unlikely in Italy, also large amounts of meat. In Italy, more than a few slices would be considered quite excessive. Also using too many ingredients, never more than three or four in Italy. Any kind of dressing, such as oil and vinegar, because they are considered to be for salads, not sandwiches. Stuff like spicy mayonnaise, honey mustard sauce, and barbecue sauce are all popular in the US, but not in Italy. Our next stop is in Spain. And do you know that they actually eat bikinis in Barcelona? Well, that is actually true. So if you ever find yourself in Catalonia, you may be very surprised to hear someone order a bikini on the patio of a cafe or a restaurant. But you see, in Catalonia, it's not just a two-piece swimsuit. The bikini is used to refer to the French ham and cheese sandwich, better known in France as croque monsieur or mixto in the rest of Spain. Indeed, the grilled bread ham and cheese sandwich is known by several names, depending on where you live. We have to go back to 1953, specifically to Sala Bikini on Diagonal Avenue to understand the origin of the word bikini for a sandwich. The French croque monsieur was imported by the owner of Sala Bikini to keep up with the times. During the Franco dictatorship in Catalonia, it was forbidden to use English or French terminology when describing goods from Spain. As a result, customers asked for El Bocadillo de la Casa, which translates to house sandwich. Nowadays, Bocadillo Bikini has become bikini. The word has now become common in the English-speaking world as well. Nowadays, Club Bikini, a nightclub and concert hall that continues to cash in on the sandwich's fame by dressing some of its employees in giant bikinis, has taken the place of Sala Bikini. But remember, Catalonia is the only place in the world where the term bikini is used. In the rest of Spain, the sandwich is called mixto. Now let's visit the Welsh. Using just one slice of bread, the Welsh rabbit reduced the amount of carbohydrates consumed. Cheese sauce is spread on its lone slice of bread and then baked to soften the cheese sauce and create a voluminous, pooling, stringy mass. The sauce is often mixed with beer and mustard, which gives it a slight spiciness. The origin of Welsh rabbit is unknown, but according to an English joke, it was created because the Welsh were so deprived that they imagined cheese was meat. Heading over to the east of Wales, to England. In England, we find two variations, which is cheese on toast and toasties. The origin of cheese on toast remains a mystery. As early as in 1912, Wilf Chambly of Halton Lancaster is credited with inventing the snack. Rabbit is said to have long existed in Wales beforehand. Today, everything from Worcestershire sauce to tomato ketchup to oxo cubes can be added to melted cheese delicacies. Cheese on toast is just simply that. It's a piece of bread with some cheddar cheese sprinkled on top and baked in the oven. And then you've got the toasties, which is two slices of bread with cheese in between. However, compared to its American counterpart, the bread in the toast is buttered on the inside, not outside like the American one, and then fried in the pan. The toastie is actually cooked in a sandwich press, sometimes with ham added to it. You probably wouldn't be surprised if I told you that I am actually 
a cheese nut. So I want to share with you a really fun fact that I found about cheese and dreams. So the British Cheese Council, yes, that exists, and I love that, did a study on the effects of cheese on sleep. According to an old wives' tale, cheese eaten before bedtime can cause nightmares or at least very vivid and unusual dreams. So they found out that 75% of the subjects had happy dreams. <laughs> One of the most intriguing discoveries was that the motifs of cheese-related dreams. Those who ate cheddar, fantasized about stardom and fame, dreams of work were triggered by eating Lancashire cheese. And the cheese that caused the most strange dreams, well, that was Tilton. So, as you can see, there are many nations all over the world that provide different versions of the dish. Besides the English toasties and Welsh rabbits, the French croque monsieurs and Italian paninis, the American grilled cheeses and Catalonian bikinis, there's a plethora of varieties and approaches to the good old melted cheese sandwich. There's also a Dutch toasty, there's an American variety called Monte Cristo, there's a Mexican quesadillo or a Venezuelan arepo de queso. The point is, the possibilities of creating something amazing with just bread and cheese are endless. And whatever you want to call the sandwich, and whichever way you want to cook it, it is just simply wonderful. On this note, I would like to wrap up our mini trip around the world of cheese sandwiches and refer you to my YouTube channel, Cheddar Cats, where I will show you how to cook four different types. The simple American classic, there's a rustic ciabatta and cheddar sandwich, and a little more fancy French baguette with gruyere and caramelized onions, which is very reminiscent of my favorite French onion soup, as well as the fancy ciabatta with brie cheese and lingonberry jam, that I have left over from the last dish I cooked, which were the Swedish meatballs. Check that out as well. And of course, you'll also find full recipes on my website. All the links are in the description of this episode. Thank you so much for being with me. Remember to eat well, train hard, love cats, and also please recycle when you can. Wherever you are in the world, I sincerely hope that you are healthy and that you are safe. Please get vaccinated. Continue to wear your mask. Take care of yourself and those around you. Bye-bye for now. And I'll be back on December 23rd with another journey.